Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV, Charlemagne the God. We are The Breakfast Club. We got our guest host with us, Lala. She's been guest Good hosting morning. yesterday and today. Hopefully, we can get it for a couple days, but she's looking at, like, this 4 o'clock in the morning, NV, ain't it? <laughs> she right in Brooklyn, maybe. Maybe. You know, maybe. You know what it is? Once you get up and get going, then I have all the energy. It's just the initial, like, you know, up. the, the yeah. initial, like, ugh. Yes. That makes it makes it hard. Now, who, who we have here now? So, I am honored and, and happy to welcome Commissioner Louis Molino, Molina to the Breakfast Club. I'm super excited to have him here today, and he is a intricate part of the reason that I'm able to do the amazing work that I do at Rikers with you know my initiative there, helping young men ages 18 to 21. And we've talked about you know all the work we do there with mm -hmm. you know servicing them while incarcerated, and also really providing them with the opportunities and and tools that they need for reentry and to become you know, productive, great members of the community. And Mr. Molina has just understands my passion and I'm learning so much from him. And mm -hmm. I just want I, I just wanted to bring him here to talk about Rikers and just his passion for what he does, his story and everything. So welcome. Welcome. Oh, good welcome. morning. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank yes, you. I'm so happy for you to be here. So Commissioner Molina, I just wanted to ask you, and we've talked about it before, mm -hmm. but like you're so you're so passionate about what you do. You're so passionate about changing the narrative of, of Rikers Island. And I just wanted to ask you, like, where does that passion and that heart that you have come from? Because it motivates me. It, it wakes me up every day and gives me that extra push to do what I do. You know, I'm learning so much from you. Like, where does that passion and commitment come from? Well, for me, it comes from just my lived experience. You know, mm -hmm. I've had very close family members that have been incarcerated on Rikers Island mm -hmm. um, back when we had adolescents. And that impacted um, my parents' marriage. It impacted our family unit. Mm -hmm. And I had opportunities growing up. You know, I grew up with both my mom and dad in my life. A lot of kids don't have that, mm -hmm. though we did have struggles. Um, and when I think people that look like us are blessed with opportunities to manage agencies where you're dealing with the majority of individuals are black and brown, that's just the reality of the criminal justice system in America, mm -hmm. then I have an obligation. People that look like us have an obligation to really make a difference so that our lived experiences are within the policies and operations of how we manage um, and really care for that population. Absolutely. And Commissioner, I was going to ask you, like, how do you how do you keep that passion and stay with that passion when every day it's you getting, you know, criticized about mm -hmm. something or everything is just a negative narrative is constantly being put out. And I'm I'm the one constantly screaming from like the mountaintops, mm -hmm. like, look what's happening like there's so many amazing things happening at rikers that you never hear about there's so many lives being changed there's so many incredible programs there's so many things that you you are doing like how do you do how do you deal with that because you gotta be i just have a strong backbone for that kind of thing sure i mean for me um human beings are worth it right mm -hmm. i think for the people that are justice involved for the men and women that work there you know we are a majority agency black and brown 44 mm percent -hmm. women um, that is a big, big compared to other law enforcement agencies in our country. Um, so the work is worth it. Um, and the people are worth fighting for, those that are incarcerated and those that are working there, mm -hmm. contract providers, volunteers like yourself. Mm -hmm. We really need a holistic approach to really solving America's criminal justice issue. Um, and for too long, I think as a country, we've done just enough to make people seem like we're doing a lot. Mm -hmm. And we just keep individuals just in a state of mediocrity and in a state of poverty, right? And we really need to make a difference and really disrupt how we manage criminal justice in this country. What's the, well, biggest, things, okay. what's the biggest things that you face, your biggest obstacles? I mean, I've had family members at mm -hmm. Rikers and and everybody that ever gets locked up in New York City, the the, the biggest thing is you got, they want to get bailed out before taking that trip over to Rikers. So mm -hmm. what is the biggest thing that you face and in, in the, in the biggest obstacle? Well, I think there were a number of big obstacles when we came in in January 1st. I mean, we had a staffing crisis where a significant number of staff weren't coming to work, right? Mm -hmm. We stopped programming, and I think when you're dealing with a, a vulnerable population— When you say staff, you mean correction officers? I mean, correction officers okay. um, were—a lot were out at the beginning of the year, and that was an ongoing thing in the latter part of 2021. So we needed to get staff back to work. But we needed to also recognize that we didn't have an organizational health strategy to support the staff that's dealing with a very challenging population while at the same time during a pandemic. They also shut down programming. And I think when you're dealing with people that are in custody, whether it's patients in a hospital, you need all of the ecosystem to still continue to work in order for that to happen. Mm 
So our biggest challenge really has been the, the mismanagement and really the dismantling of really of a core part of the criminal justice system in the city. When you think about corrections, the corrections department spends the most time with those that are just involved. If you get it, when you get arrested by the police, you may not see that police officer unless you go to trial. And then in many cases, defendants are not really engaging consistently either with the prosecutor or even mm -hmm. with their own defense attorneys, right? Know. They go to court every time. There may be a new defense attorney that's managing their case. So we have a, 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 a time to try to engage with the individual to deal with the root drivers of why there are justice involved. And I think that's very, very important work that has to be done. So I think there's a number of complex challenges. We've come a long way over the last year, but we have a long way to go. You know, you're the commissioner of the Department of Corrections and they call these institutions correctional facilities, right? But what is actually being done to correct, you know, th these prisoners? Like a lot of times they get thrown in jail, they don't get any resources, mm -hmm. you know, they don't mm -hmm. learn any trades that when they get out, they can actually, you know, be productive in society. They're not getting great education. The food is terrible, so their health isn't, you know, uh, being benefited. So what is actually being done to correct prisoners? Sure, that's a great question. And I think um, the mayor talks about this all the time, about solving these upstream problems. So we have to understand that a lot of people that are injustice involved are there because of a lack of a nationwide public health strategy to deal with issues like mental illness, substance abuse addiction, mm -hmm. sometimes that's co-occurring and you have both. I think when you look at corrections, you have to understand that there's two parts of it. New York City Department of Corrections is a jail, so it's a temporary detention place, and that's what it's meant for. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have a responsibility and try to improve people's outcomes. So we do not determine who comes to us, but we have an obligation as an organization to try to improve their outcomes. Now, in many cases, um, we're dealing with individuals and we're offering educational opportunities, access to health care and treatment that they didn't have in their own communities for whatever reason, um, trying to deal with vocational training. But because their time with us is so temporary, the level of engagement that you have at a jail, while important, is not the same time of long-term engagement that you may have in a state prison. Mm -hmm. So I think we want to get to a pace where we have, when we talk about continuum of care, whether somebody's being released back to their community, so a returning citizen, or going to an upstate prison, you want to make sure that there's some level of alignment in case management support when you go back to your community, but you also need that same level of alignment with the state prison to say, listen, this individual participated, let's say, in college programs, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. has showed an interest in this type of vocational training. Can we align those opportunities with the state facility that they may go to if they get more time after their case is do we still look at Do we still look at, I guess, prisoners as innocent and to proven guilty? Because a lot of times it's like when when people go to jail, and I'm sure Lala mm -hmm. deals with a lot of people where a lot of people feel like they're innocent. They didn't do anything, and they're there wrongfully. Do we still look at them as innocent and to prove guilty, or is it like, because everything we said is, you know, changing and, you know, go to trial. But a lot of people feel like they're innocent, or they might be innocent. Yeah, absolutely. So the majority of those that are in our custody are pretrial detainees, and they are, in fact, innocent and to proven guilty. Mm -hmm. And there's two things you got to remember. One is, at our core, the Department of Corrections does not have a role in punishment. Our role is to take in people that the court has determined for whatever reason they need to be in pre-trial detainee status mm -hmm. or sometimes their sentence. The other thing is when we engage with those that are justice involved, we have to do it absent from judgment. Listen, people make mistakes, right? And mm -hmm. some of those mistakes are, are, are really horrible ones. And mm -hmm. we have to remember that there's victims at the, at, at the end of all of those stories. Mm -hmm. But the majority of these individuals are going to come back to our communities, and we don't want them to come back more broken than when they entered. We want them to come back to be productive members of their communities, societies, be able to contribute not only to their own well-being, but if you want to stop generational incarceration, then you have to solve today's generation, right, and save them. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they transition the normality of incarceration and justice involvement to their children or other children that they may be involved in, in contact with. No, it's imperative because sadly, man, you know, they always say you got to be still sometimes in order to learn. And sadly, you know, for a lot of young people, jail is the place that makes them be still, mm -hmm. you know, and finally listen to someone. That's why I think it's imperative to have these programs in place, you know, to get through to people while they're, you know, in, in, in your custody. Absolutely. I agree. Totally agree. And even in, in my initiative, you hear the young men speak so much about what you just said, like, I realized this happened for a reason. This might have actually saved my mm -hmm. life. You hear it Absolutely. because if I was continuing on the path I was going, anything could have happened. So you hear that often that I needed to be be still or sit, mm -hmm. sit down for a minute. But 
you know, I've just never worked with someone like uh, Commissioner Molina who just is just so supportive of people like myself coming in and just being able to lend my time and my experience to the incarcerated population. And we're seeing so many tremendous things come from that. People just need some motivation, some love, some mm -hmm. opportunities. And even and even if they know that some of these things are afforded at, at these um, facilities, sometimes they just need the motivation to utilize them. Like mm -hmm. we just, um, the Peace Center is a new uh, young adult facility that, that opened up and it's just like, hey, do you know about the Peace Center? You need to go down there. There's so many amaz amazing things. Sometimes they just need that push to say, all right, I can do this. I want to do this. And that's where I feel like, you know, people like us can come in and really, really make a difference. What is, what is the Peace Center? Mm -hmm. So the Peace Center is um, the Program Education and Community Engagement Center. Mm -hmm. And we have that at the Robert and Davern Center. Um, and that's where Lala does most of her work. Mm -hmm. And it's an opportunity for young men that live in the same living unit to come. Um, and it's very incentive driven. We have horticulture there. We have digital literacy. We have gym equipment there. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of... Um, social interaction, not only with the young men with each other, but with staff, contract mm -hmm. providers, volunteers that come in. And to Lala's point, you know, with her Initiative 360, mm -hmm. that's what it has to be around, a holistic approach, right? We can't have pre-engagement, engagement while they're with us mm -hmm. and not have engagement when they get out, right? Mm -hmm. Individuals need navigators and shepherds, right? Whether they're facing incarceration or not, um, young people need to be guided. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to think of what does that whole thing look like? And when you have communities where you're dealing with a single parent household, right? So maybe mom or dad works more than one job and your home being the mom or dad to your younger sibling, there's challenges that you have in life where you need adult interaction to help mm -hmm. guide you. And I think through Lada's initiative, we're seeing that. And a lot of the other the programmatic um, offerings that we have in our system is really thinking about how do we care for these individuals to get them address the root drivers of why they were justice involved. When you came in, Rikers was in like a really bad state because, you know, the, the previous administration had years of like failed upkeep. Why, why was that such a big issue for you? Yeah, so I mean, it, saying that it was in a bad state is putting it kindly. I mean, quite frankly, it was on the brink of collapse. Mm. And I think- They were gonna close it down. Yeah, yeah, so well, the Rikers is still closing by the okay. Broad-Based Jail Plan and the local law by mm -hmm. 2027. And I understand the symbolism because listen, for those that have experienced incarceration there, challenges in working in a very challenging environment, I understand, you know, the emotion attached to the closing of Rikers Island. But when the decision, and this is my opinion, was made to close Rikers Island, they stopped investing not only in the people that work there and mm -hmm. think about any organization, private or public sector, if you don't invest in your staff, your staff is not gonna be able to support the mission that the organization mm -hmm. has. Mm -hmm. Even worse, we didn't invest in our infrastructure. So we have old buildings on Rikers Island. Um, they don't address the problems of how do you manage a population today um, efficiently. And I think all of that in totality, when the decision was said that Rikers should close, quite frankly, the Department of Corrections has got abandoned. Mm -hmm. And even prior to that, it has always been significantly underfunded in order to handle its mission which is a core mission of our criminal justice system. So what happens to all those prisoners if they do close Rikers Island? Are they building another jail? Are they spreading them out through the jails in New York? Or what, what happens So, you know, case? as the mayor has said, we are working on and devising a plan B, which is quite frankly needed. Mm -hmm. The borough-based jails only have the capacity to hold approximately 3,300 people. We have close to 6,000 people today. We have done forecasting, which is pretty sophisticated that by 2024, if nothing changes in the administration of justice within the court systems and the district attorney's mm -hmm. offices, then we are likely going to be at 7,000 people conservatively in 2024. Mm -hmm. So you bring up a very important point. Where did the balance of those individuals go? So we have to sort of think that through. Um, where do they get housed, right? Because we want to have a bed capacity that can manage the population that the courts have determined need some level of temporary incarceration now, I think we are a city that should be proud that we have the lowest per capita incarceration rate of any large American city in America. So I'm not advocating um, mass incarceration by any means. I think we also need to expand our resources for mental illness, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. substance abuse, right? So Definitely. that the jail system doesn't become the primary That's leader right. in dealing with these issues, right? Why is it? Like people with mental illness and substance abuse should not be incarcerated. Yeah, so I think, you know, we could spend hours talking about right. how we get to this point, right? And, other I, institutions and, and, I, and I think the, the pivot starts is mm -hmm. the dismantleization of inpatient 
psychiatric treatment mm -hmm. in the late 80s. Mm -hmm. You go into the 90s, we have the 1994 crime bill, and think about where we were in 1994. We had, what, three or five news stations. We didn't have social media. But, you know, there was a movement out there that violence and crime was on the rise and, and people wanted accountability and they just wanted their kids to walk home to school safely. Mm -hmm. um, so from 1994 going in for the, over the next many, many years, what was funded and built was an apparatus of incarceration where we lead the, the globe on the incarceration of our own people. Um, setting that now, here we are today, there's been a lot of movement in criminal justice reform. Many of the things I support, I think there are unintended consequences to some of these things you can't say you want to do things and then not fund for the outcome you're trying to achieve when you say you want to mm -hmm. want to um, either deal with sort of bail reform or deal with how the courts and the DAs provide discovery evidence. All that has to be supported with funding so that the outcomes you actually want can be achieved. So I think, you know, we have to do everything we can to really be very evidence-based in what mm -hmm. we're trying to do um, and really support the entire system to be able to divert those that are dealing with addiction those that are dealing with mental illness Absolutely. away from the criminal justice system and really towards a more public health system, which we don't have in this nation. And we learned that during COVID, everybody thought, you know, America has a public health system to some degree, but it's really supported by a lot of private organizations, mm -hmm. hospitals, and they, they had to work and pivot to be more interconnected yeah. to deal with a large pandemic. And I think we really just need a reset and really a disruption and just really the thinking of how we manage our criminal justice system. Yes, to go through. Okay, you know, I, 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 last question, you know, I think about jail, right? Jail should be humane, mm -hmm. but not necessarily nice. Cause it's jail, mm -hmm. right? So I, I wanna ask you on a scale of like one to four seasons, mm -hmm. what do you think the conditions of like a jail should be? So I think um, jail at its core has to be on a foundation of humanity mm -hmm. and, and managing individuals, right? You're still dealing, you're dealing with human beings, mm -hmm. right? Um, especially for those that are young adults, mm -hmm. their brain is still going through brain development. Mm -hmm. And you want to take all of the drivers into consideration of why somebody's justice involved. So yeah, you want to be a humane, but understand that, again, we don't have a role in punishment, right? We have a role in making sure that we're providing a safe and secure environment. So for programs can be successful for those mm -hmm. that want to engage in programming to deal with their issue. We remind ourselves at the jail level that those have, they have not been convicted, so they're still presumed innocent. Mm -hmm. um, and that adds a certain layer of making sure that we're, we're empathetic to that. But remind ourselves, our job is not to punish people. Mm -hmm. Our job is to provide mm -hmm. a custodial mm -hmm. service of those that the court has deemed need to be within the care and control of this, the government mm -hmm. versus being out in public. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Thank I was you for so ha you happy to have you here today. And thank you for opening up the doors and allowing me to come in and, and do my work and fulfill my passion. It's it's incredible what you do. And you're such an amazing leader for all of us. So thank, thank you, you so thank much. You. Tell me the name of the program, La. For so my program is 360. Hey, my 360 crew, your shout out is coming soon. So get ready. <laughs> get ready. Get around the radio. It's coming soon. The 360 initiative. I'll talk a little bit about it when I shout out the whole crew. All right. All right. Yeah. It's the Breakfast Club. Positive Notes up next. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you.